Welcome home. The two words that most veterans yearn for from the time they leave for basic training till their dying day and every day in between. It's all about coming home, being home, and what does that even look like? On this podcast, we talk about the transformation that we make as troops and boots one day to veterans in the civilian world. It starts the day that we sign on the dotted line and ends the day they put us in the grave. This podcast is meant for veterans, their family members, employers, and really anybody that wants to better understand what it's like to be a veteran in the civilian world. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Dylan. Dylan, last week, episode one, this is now episode two. We're getting into this as a passion project. Last week, a lot of it, what we focused on was about Vet TV and Danny. Let's talk about you for a little bit, a little more longer version introduction. I'll talk about me a little bit more. So we can establish who we are within our community, and then I would love to hear about what you want to talk about this week. Sure. Do you want to start with uh, just me introducing more about me and my life? My yeah. What, what, I guess the best thing is why, yeah, why, why you decided to be part of this podcast with me. So let's start there. Well, ultimately, you're a very special and interesting person um, to say to say the least. So I'll, I'll put that out there. Um, I. I I love your energy. I love who you are. Um, I love your uh, ability to vocalize everything that you, everything that you have to say, whether it's right or wrong, doesn't matter. I just love your ability to express it. Um, and so I, I, I felt the I felt the need to to be a part of this because you and I have been able to have a relationship where I can approach things that you disagree with, and yet still have a civilized conversation. Now, I don't know if you're able to do that to every, everybody, but I'm, I'm quite good at that as a, as a natural capacity to question people's motives, whether they, their character, you know, with, with as much respect as I can. Um, and I felt like this is a great place to do that. And not to mention that I'm a veteran myself. I've been in the military for 15 years, and I feel like we have a lot to share and a lot to expose to people, both veterans and non-veterans that can potentially help a lot of people. Yeah, no, I, I do. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, you and I met a year ago now and started with, well, like most things, you know, met met in the real world at a networking event, turned into let's go get lunch. And then, yep. yeah, there was this deep peace. And, and what I what I do enjoy, you know, I think about uh, civil discourse. Um, you know, you and I, if the average person would say, oh, look at them. They're both white males under 40 fathers, veterans, oh, they must think about the world the same way. And it's like, well, Not within really. our community of veterans, it's like, well, no, he's a National Guard guy. I mean, who, who does that, right? <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, he makes his living on TikTok, right? Yep. I hate TikTok. Yep. And he talks about warm and fuzzies, and he's slow in his cadence. Like a, a lot of the things that I'm not. We're, we're, very, but, we're very different. <laughs> very different there where I'm like, louder is always better. What do you mean? <laughs> um, so no, I appreciate that. And like you, it's been 18 years I've been in the army. I joined at 20. Um, you know, I wanted to join at 17 and needed waivers and didn't make it a priority and finally joined at 20. And, um, you know, coming up on 19 years in the army reserves, it's, I, I've lived my almost entire adult life in, in both worlds. And yeah. what I realized, especially after my last deployment, I got back from Gitmo 2015, and I started a business, and I was very anti using my veteran angle in in business. So back it up a little bit. 2004, I joined the Army. 2006, um, I left for deployment, got home in May of 7. So I was gone 15, 18 months, whatever, uh, 17 months, whatever total. And, and then from, from that point on, 2007 until really 2000. 16 when i started my business most people they knew i was in the army they knew i was a veteran but that was kind of it that was it was you know thank you was the start and end of a lot of conversations right and then when i got back and started uh my business doing junk removal and now i've since transformed and it's changed and now camel crew junk removal um i leaned in on the veteran angle and that was awesome at first it's like oh people want to support me because i'm a vet but then all of a sudden it's like People are like, oh, hey, you speak for all veterans. What's your perspective on this? And it's like, well, right. that's awfully overwhelming. Or it was, hey, you should support this nonprofit because we're veteran-centric. And it's like, oh, okay. And then I ended up giving a lot of time in areas that maybe I did or did not agree on. But I was like, oh, this is what my purpose is. Um, 
and and I also realized that a lot of people came to me and they're like, hey, I got a brother-in-law or sister-in-law or my spouse or this employee I work with. I don't know where to start. Right. You know, and I, I, I talk about, you know, uh, spite is a hell of a drug, right? It's, it, 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 you know, it, being being spiteful of, of military service or frustration with the lack of benefits um, that the uh, the Army, uh, the DOD in general offer. And it's like, well, th- that's a hell of a drug to get me motivated to do it. But success is much more sustainable. And at the end of the day, the I had to learn this over time, but the Department of Defense job is to win wars. Yep. And and you can get up as shitty as you want about the VA and all these other places. It's like, you know, the DOD job is to win wars. As soon as you are no longer a war fighter, you're not their responsibility. And we, as veterans, have to take care of ourselves. And and how do we take care of our community? And, yeah. and as veterans, what does that mean? Right? We had Danny on last week, and he's out, out. And one of the things that he stressed, and I thought about this entire last week, was, you know, someday you have to stop identifying as a veteran first. Right. And it's kind of a kind of a clutch. I mean, hell, I, I don't have a beard or mustache today because I had drill this weekend. Yeah. I, I'm a career counselor. I, I put the uniform on two days in a row. I put up a fa- post on Facebook in the motor pool. Like, I'm still doing the thing, you know, and, and spending yeah. time with soldiers, and I, and I, and I love it. There's going to be a day I take off that uniform. Yeah. And even Monday mornings, right? My girlfriend used to joke. I, I, th- I think I talked about this last episode. My my girlfriend, this is years ago when I got back from Iraq, uh, would, would joke, but pretty serious, that I was an asshole on the Monday after drill. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I was a squad leader at the time, and it's like, I yelled, I had to chase down troops all day, and I was yelling at them or whatever, right? And it's like, well, I wasn't an asshole; I was just <laughs> reprogrammed. And um, and so let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about what does it mean to be a veteran, right? We we right. use that word, right? And let's go into a little bit about the the citizen soldier, right? That's the nomenclature. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I'm. I, th- I think to to define it. Clearly, right? Like to, to simply define it, a veteran is someone that has that has served their country, um, whether in a time of war or not, mm-hmm. um, that has served more or less honorably. It's it, you know, it's I don't want to necessarily look at people who have been general discharged or dishonorably discharged and say they're not a veteran, but they don't have the same you know goodwill intentions of uh, someone that's been honorably discharged um or they so, made or they, or they made stupid choices right you know i and, mean it got caught i mean i i, yeah. I, I hear that and like you're right like i i, I get twitchy when yeah. i hear a general discharge or dishonorable discharge how like there's a guy who used to work for me he's one of the best dudes i can know you know mm-hmm. came back off afghanistan he was a little fuckered up yep smoked some weed got kicked out of the army and and right it's like well he's not a turd of a person he made a choice yeah that Dis- didn't work out for him. Dishonorable. That's yeah. when I'm like, there, there's usually. Right, let's draw the line. Yeah, there's there's a substantial reason why it's right. not it's... general or not other than honorable conditions. Right. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, technically they're a veteran, but it, uh, and, and it, it doesn't take much to ra- raise your right hand and have a recruiter lie for you and say you're an honorable person, right? Because that's yeah. one, of the, one of the questions of recruiters. Like, does, is this person good, you know, uh, bearing and, and they don't give a shit. Right. Yeah. They're supposed right. to scrub for that. And maybe back in the 1940s, that mattered. I, I can tell you, having been recruited, right. I mean, if you showed up you and you could, you know, you could fog up a mirror. Yeah. So anyway, when, sorry. when, when readiness is, uh, is necessary, like when we oh. need more people, oh, yeah. the, the oh. standards get way more. hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, all, all of a sudden face tattoos and neck tattoos and hand tattoos yeah. and felonies are like, well, that's okay. Yeah, well, I mean, hell, look, look, I mean, wave, waivers for days. We look what's happening. <laughs> what's uh, the in, maximum amount of waivers I can put on a person? <laughs> exactly. It went from no charges to no drug charges to no violent charges to, right. all right, you're not a murderer. Yeah. Even if you are, you're pre qualified. Right. <laughs> put you in the Total. infantry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're, you're a go at this station. It, all right. Okay. So being a veteran, what, what, is that, what does that mean to you, right? Being a veteran, not just you, Dylan, but when, when you work with your your clients that are soldiers or that are, that, are, that have served, I think I think it represents sacrifice. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, people people often you know they they say the, the term "thank you for your service," um, and and I've I've never really looked at it that way. Um, I I don't I feel remarkably awkward coming up to another back veteran and saying "thank you for your service" because it's usually 
in, you know, I don't know about your circles, but within my circles, that's, we joke about that, right? Like, well, our veterans, they will like, hey, thank you for your service. You know, right. like so we, my response to that is you're welcome for your freedom. Right. Right. Because it's, you know what, if you're going to make it awkward, I'm going to make it just as awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And my buddies will put stuff up. Yeah. We have a couple group chats, the guys I went to Iraq with and whatever else. And it's like, I thank for your service. And it, it becomes, it's a mockery. Yeah. Within our community. So I, I look at being a veteran as, as a willingness to sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you have obviously sacrificed 19 years, right? It's not exactly active duty, 19 years, but it's 19 years of you constantly turning on and off a switch that is yeah. remarkably hard to turn on and off. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it represents something where there's a discipline there's a fortitude. There's 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 so many different character traits within that person that allowed them or showed them that this was the thing that they needed to sacrifice for. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a sense of duty. It's a sense of honor. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean they're a good person, um, and mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing to look at when we talk about veterans because just because you're a veteran doesn't mean you're a good person. It oh. means you have a willingness to sacrifice, um, mm. and so. You know, like we we talk, we can talk about goodness and badness in, in veterans, but the identity itself, I think, is focused around. I'm willing to give something up for my country, and so it kind of, in in many circles, I think it puts this resentment on people that are not willing to do the same. Um, hmm. Whereas in some in, in other circles, like the circles that I try and live within, there's a there's a positive connotation on veteran in terms of I was willing to sacrifice and I appreciate everyone that also did the same. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I do. I see that. And, and I go with, I love the word sacrifice. And like you said, right, 19 you're going on 19 years now, three years um, activated in some capacity. Like, yeah, my daughter was five months old when I left for deployment. Even those first five months of her life, I was gone half of it. You know, I, I went to a couple of different trainings, um, you know, CLS, non-lethal weapon school, master resiliency trainer, right? Those two weeks, you're like, well, was, those were two great weeks of my life. Well, it's like, well, that was also two weeks that I wasn't with my daughter, right? right? And then I deployed when she was five months old, and I got back when she was 18 months, right? Five months old, it's this thing, it's this That's thing crazy. you just have to keep alive. And all of a sudden, 18 months, she's walking, talking, thinking. Like, yeah, I wasn't there for the first words, the first steps, the first food, like, yeah, I, I wasn't there, and and it's interesting you talk about that, like turning it on and off, and it's like for me, I live a very uh, binary life, you know. Like even even you know, I'm a business owner, and it's like, well, you know, I don't take my laptop home because if I did, I would never stop working. So it's like yeah. I leave I leave I leave work to go play volleyball so I can go home, sleep, wake up, and go back to work. Right? It's like very binary. I, I've disciplined myself, and and I, I've never thought about it that way, even through a weekend. It's like. You know, Friday night before a drill, it's like I got a fresh haircut and a beard. It's like Saturday morning. Like, I hate waking up Saturdays, but it's like when I go to drill, it's like I'm on time. I'm standing tall. I'm looking yeah. good, ready to go. And, I'm a half hour early, 45 minutes early, an hour I'm, early. I'm not. I'm a, I'm a career counselor. I get there about 830. And, and, and uh, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, there's no first formation for me. First yeah. formation is when I come and sit down <laughs> and turn on my laptop. That's actually this weekend I, uh, I re-enlisted soldiers. But that's the other thing. So, you know, I realized soldiers are part of my job. And, like, I was in a formation. I never, I mean, formations don't apply to me. But uh, <laughs> but I took a lot of pride in it. I took a lot of pride in watching two soldiers, um, uh, both sergeants, both six years in, that said, hey, I want to do some more of this, right? And they raised their right hand. And, hell, that, that made me feel good, right? It goes back to the tattoo on my shoulder, right? It says, for God and country. And I'm not even religious, right? So it's like, well, why do we do this? Right, I I know the reasons why I joined. Yeah, you know, I I remember when when we got back from Iraq, and I was twenty three at the time, and uh, there was these guys on Harleys that picked us up, a bunch of old Vietnam vets on Harleys that picked us up from, um, we we flew into in Indianapolis International Airport, whatever I don't know what its real name is, whatever Indianapolis, and then we got on buses and we went down to Camp Atterbury, but I remember getting off the plane, you know, and, and they're just like, hey, you're a combat veteran now. I tell you what, you know, you don't get to pick those defining moments in your life. Yeah. But when some random token bearded, hardly up <laughs> veteran 
looked at me. Oh, I'm getting fucking choked up right now. Looked and said, hey, you're a combat veteran. That fucking meant something, right? It was like, yeah. well, I drove a truck for a year in Iraq, right? Talk about sacrifice. To me, it was an adventure. It was a job. It was an opportunity, right? I, I grew up watching movies. I, I loved every war movie there was from, um, you know, pl Platoon to Torah, Torah, Torah to um, Black Hawk Down, whatever. I watched them all, you know, and I was like, man, I'm a goddamn combat veteran. Like, yeah. and, and in some ways, that was in uh, 2017, spring, spring of 2017. I mean, I, I think about that moment like it was yesterday, and that moment in my life to find up until now my life in a lot of ways and you know you talk about sacrifice i think of selfless service right that's one of the seven army values and it's like that's what matters to me right because it's like what can you do as a veteran now in the civilian world that works in both places right selfless service this this weekend when i was at drill my job is ret in retention right my that that let's down and dirty right we, we call ourselves career counselors we are an Army Reserve career to career group. They changed this ARCG. Right? We talk about careers, but at the end of the day, mission is retention, right? Yeah. Like you're infantry, your mission is eliminate the enemy, right? Let's let's. Okay, so our job is retention. But I spent an hour with the soldier this weekend doing a budget because he's like, I'm terrible with money. I'm broke. I work two jobs. My girlfriend works a job. We want to buy a house. We want to have a kid, right? And, and in doing so, selfless service. I spent an hour using my skills, abilities in my craft, which is running businesses and finance, to give to that soldier. I could have been like, hey, man, oh, you don't want to reenlist? Sorry about you. Right? Yeah. Not not my, right, but I'm like, no. And and same, too, with me. It's like I, I could have just left early that day or done a lot of different things. But I was like, no, I, I felt so rewarded giving this soldier my time and ability. And that's what that's what a lot of veterans yearn for when they come back. Yeah, It's like. In, in the military, there's you're, there, there's never you're never short of work. You're never short of mission and purpose. You come back home and all of a sudden you're like DD two fourteen and chill, and you're twenty pounds heavier with no mission. Yep. I, th I think you know what one thing I think you're touching on that I think is is very much a part of the identity of veterans is leadership. Mm -hmm. Is you know for for a lot of my career in the infantry, um, I think. A lot of leaders looked at leadership as an opportunity um, that they could choose. Like they could choose when and when they wanted to be a leader and when they didn't. Um, mm. And it really affected our unit until yep. I think we. Well, I I always looked at it as leadership as an obligation, right? When you step yep. into your your stripes or step into a leadership position, even without uh, sergeant stripes, you are obligated to do for others rather than do for yourself first mm -hmm. that's that's part of the nco creed um and and i think one of the things that really reminds people why they serve is actually that kind of attitude of i serve now not for not for god not for country not for anything else it's for the people around me like i very much enjoy my unit i very much enjoy the people that I bring into, you know, my circle of of the infantry, and I I value that time uh, that we we get to choose uh, together, right? Like I I get to lead, but I try to lead in a collaborative sense where everyone has a say and everyone has the ability to kind of bring something to the table that's mm -hmm. valuable, and that I think is where you know the veterans that have been in a long time, that's where like they, they see that collaborative sense of we're all veterans. We've all sacrificed. We all have good ideas. Let's figure this out together. And they're all good at leadership. They're all good mm -hmm. at, Hey, let's do this. Let's get this done. Right. The, the, the one thing that you can say about many veterans, I would say most veterans is that they don't lack uh, the willingness to do when, told to do so hmm. right like it's easy to say hey i need i need five people right and you know the first five people that are going to come out of 100 people are probably going to be veterans right if it's a group of civilians and veterans it's probably yeah. going to be like veterans being like i'll be there right especially <laughs> if it's a veteran asking them hey i need five oh, people yeah. to help me do this you know well, right that, well because because you're already prone to this right because you raised your right hand when nobody else did yep 
right? You already decided, hey, I'm going to put other people forward. I'm going to give of myself. And then when you join the military, it is instilled in you from day one, whether it's more uh, uh, punishment-minded, right, uh, because you done, you done screwed up or because shit had to happen and someone had to do it. Or because you, you're like, hey, you know what? If I want to be a leader, the best thing I can do is do first, right? I think about yeah. the military. I said this. I figured this out in basic training. I've lived my military life like this, and I've also lived my personal life like this. And I continually have to remind myself when I'm doing the woe is me shit. But it is, if I volunteer for everything, they can't make me do anything. <laughs> right? Pretty much. <laughs> That was my, and, and here's what the other thing is, v- veterans that are listening to this podcast will appreciate, they know it. You know, for those of us that have been NCOs, me especially as a platoon sergeant, I knew if I'm like, hey, I need three I need three volunteers. I knew with a certain level of certainty, I knew which five hands were going to pop up. Yeah. Right? And those are the first five people I'm not going to make do shit. I'm going to have, I'm, <laughs> because they're always the ones that volunteer, right? Yeah. Even among veterans, they're the ones that volunteer. That's my high-speed E5. That's my... You know, my E4 that is chomping at the bit to become a non-commissioned officer. That's the E2 that came out of basic and wants to prove himself to somebody, right? Hell, one of the best soldiers I had, uh, E4 female type Clemens, right? She was really badass, five foot two, 100 pounds on a good fucking day. And I knew she would take out anything and everything to prove it to people that she belonged there. Uh, I was looking through old pictures today. Um, I'm writing a book, and they need some pictures of me in service for the book I'm writing. And I found the pictures of Clemens. I had her pin on my E7 rank at the time because I was like, hey, who's the soldier that volunteers for everything, right? A lot of people get like a sergeant major to come in or battalion commander and be like, oh, pin. no, F- find me find me that specialist that I know busted their ass when they were, you know, in my charge, right? That That's, right, talk about selfless, right? Like I, I wanted to make it her moment as much as it was my moment, right? I don't, I don't make E7 in my military career if I don't have soldiers that are willing to put the work in and follow my leadership because my leadership, especially when I was a first platoon sergeant, wasn't great. I, I was a team leader for a long time, squad leader for a short amount of time, and then boom, you're a platoon sergeant. And and I wasn't I was not a great leader. And I, I still to this day I'll, I I won't argue that I'm I'm a great leader. It's something I've had to really put my work in. And it's not from lack of desire. It's from lack of understanding what it meant to be a leader. Yeah. You know, I, I thought being a leader meant I had to do everything myself. Because I remember seeing when I was in E3 and E4 and I was in Motor Trans still, it's like you had these E5s and E6s that thought, oh, once I make E5, then I stop working. <laughs> well, fuck, I was like, no, it's the opposite, right? So then I went to the other extreme of, no, no, that means I got to do everything. Well, when you do everything, right, you're not leading anybody you and you end up micromanaging. Right, right, because I did the opposite, right? Because when you, right, you, you, again, you can do Right. Uh, you know, it's that, you know, sometimes always never. Right. But it's like you can do everything. You can do nothing or you can do some things. And I was the I'm going to do everything guy because I wanted to prove to myself and everybody else that I was willing to do everything. And it's like, well, that's not repeatable and sustainable. Yeah. It's no different than the civilian world here. Right. If you're a veteran out there and you're like, nope, I don't need to ask for support. I hate the word help. But if you say, hey, I don't need to ask for support. I'm going to figure it out. I don't need the VA. I don't need my battle buddies. I don't need other veterans group, or I don't need to talk to people. It's like that, that, that'll get you killed. Yeah. It's like everything points to you need others. Hell, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You need people. And yet we got veterans every day that feel like they can do it on their own. And then they make choices, habitual, right? We talk about suicide, very, very open and honest on this podcast. And it's like, Suicide is, a, is an end state choice. You don't start there. Right. Right. You get there and you get there because you're not, you know, obs- hell, I talk about the OODA loop in business, right? Observe, orient, decide, act. Right. If you're observing the world and you're not orienting yourself to what is good, what is healthy, right? And then making healthy decisions, eventually in your head, you're limited to just basically one decision. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a result, it's not the problem. No. It's something I've, I've talked about a lot, um, even in my own book. It's suicide, especially, you know, like we, we kind of talked about it in, in episode one, but my suicide was, was actually, um, you know, very much crafted through the years. Um, I actually chose to join the military because I wanted to die. 
Um, mm-hmm. That was my that was my sole reason for joining. Though I didn't tell people that. I told people, you know, I joined because of nine eleven because it was an it was a convenient excuse. Um, yep. But ultimately, in two thousand eight, when I when I did join, um, I joined at seventeen with a waiver from my mom. Um, even before my, my birthday was in like two weeks, and I still was like, I want to join now. And my mom was like, yeah. I I know you're not going to say no. Like you're not yeah. going to put this away. Um, so she signed the waiver, but I wanted to go to Afghanistan, Iraq, somewhere where I could, I could ultimately die. Um, Mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't feel that anymore. I haven't felt that in quite some time, but it was, that was my intention was I was crafting my own death in many ways because of the many things that I went through. And I think this is also a part of the kind of the veteran identity is we are a bunch of people who don't necessarily fit in with the rest of society, or we're running from something or we're moving away from something or toward unity and and camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I see so many veterans who have past trauma that they don't recognize, um, join the military and try to, fill that void that their, their lost parent didn't, didn't fill for them or their, um, their abusive parent or their, you know, whatever trauma happened in their life, um, kind of brought them to a point of, I don't fit in here Mm -hmm. and I want people that will help me kind of be a part of something. I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. Well, oftentimes I think that comes from not having a place in in your home in childhood and whatever place you're in right oftentimes we see people move into the military um so many people have been traumatized before but they've never recognized it and so they Mm -hmm. they then fill this gap and fill this void with something that is arguably not exactly the healthiest thing uh to deal with but also at the same time something that is quite helpful right like for me the yeah. military actually completely shifted my perspective and it was something that I really valued every day. It didn't take away the, the suicidal thoughts, not, not certainly not until 2015 um, when I decided to change that. But that mindset of, uh, of you know, don't be, don't be the problem in the team. Don't be the, don't be the one, right? Like, you know, sacrifice for the team that, that kind of brought me to a really difficult point in my life where I had to, I had to really look at myself and say, what am I doing? Um, and I had to address a lot of things, not necessarily just my military service, but everything that had happened in my life and why I had that perspective. And I think that identity is very much shared throughout a lot of the veteran community of, wow, I have all of this stuff from the military. But then at some point you actually look beyond the military and what happened in your past. And you're like, all of this culminated to a point where here I am. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes we hear the result of that as suicide, but we also hear, you know, like we talked with Danny last, last week, the other result can be addiction, alcoholism, right? Drugs, uh, uh, many different addictions that can cause a remarkable amount of problems not to mention all the relationship issues that come along with everything that we go through and, and the switches that we can't turn off after we've you know been to Afghanistan or been to Iraq. Um, and so I think that identity is also kind of very much wrapped up in how we actually either recognize or don't recognize trauma, um, how we talk or don't talk about the things that we're, we really should be talking about. Well, that's that. Oh no, hundred percent. That's that subconscious versus conscious, right? Like I am conscious that when I put my uniform on, I, 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 I act different and I am different when I'm around soldiers, right? I mean, the cadence of my voice changes. I, I, I stand just a, just a hair taller, right? So it's like, you know, those are very conscious things, but in, 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 it's been in relationships primarily with civilians that have brought up this other stuff, the subconscious stuff. It's like, um, one of my, my recent relationships I was in, she'd say, why is it that everything revolves around being a veteran? And I'm like, it certainly doesn't, right? Obviously, I have a business that's veteran-owned and I wear camo pants, but that's kind of who I am, right? It's like, 
in my head, I'm like, well, I don't wear the T-shirt that says I'm a veteran. I don't wear the hat that says I'm a veteran. I'm not hanging out at the VFW, right? I'm not doing these things that I think the classic veteran has. But what she's saying is subconsciously I see the world through a veteran lens. Yeah. Right. Even as you were talking, I wrote down a couple couple notes. It's like you're talking about some things that I'm all about language, right? You talk about some things about, you know, who you are and how you want to show up. And it's like, right, in the military, there's some sayings that we have that, that contribute to that, right? Like, don't be that guy, mm-hmm. right? Don't, wait, they, that's, a, that's a military. So don't be that guy. Don't be the guy that lets down the rest of the team. Don't be the guy that fucks up, right? Or, hey, but did you die? <laughs> right. Right. Like, that's one of my favorite ones in the civilian world. It's like, culturally we're just like okay like the civilian world like whatever i want something that's different where death might be an option yeah right regardless if you wanted to die like we joked about in iraq i mean especially towards the end of the tour it was like well what are you gonna do when you come go back home and it's like well fuck i didn't thought about that i joined the goddamn army in 2004 as a truck driver hauling fuel in iraq like my plan was to die and not because I wanted to die, but that was, you know, when you're 22, 23, it was like... You're driving a fuel well, truck. Well, I didn't die. <laughs> now, that, now I don't know what to do, right? Like, right. like when you go to high school, you're like, I'm going to graduate and get a job, because that's a next logical step. Like, when you've w- watched every war movie there is, you're just like, well, I ought to have the decency to die. And, you know, right, like what, Thomas Paine, like, right, I only the only regret I have is that I have but one life to live, give to my country. Was that Thomas Paine that said that? I'm going to look that up now. But anyways, like... um. Because that, that's the mindset. Or I always think about the movie in, uh, the, the movie Jarhead early on. The drill sergeant was talking to Jake Gyllenhaal's character, and he's like, hey, did, you know, he was talking about his, his dad being a Vietnam veteran. He's like, did he have the decency to die in Vietnam? And he's like, no. And it's like, like we we have this acceptance that dying is is the like, we're again, like, I was going to say, ultimate sacrifice, right? And we pride ourselves on that we're willing to die, right? We're, we pride ourselves on the fact that, uh, what we're willing to, to sign that check up and uh, up uh, up into our life. Hell, you know, this weekend I watched the Army Navy game, and I don't, I'm not like super into the Army Navy game. It, you know, I went to stop my life for it, but it was after drill. I was at home making dinner, like at my house, whatever. It was snow, it was cold outside, and I'm like, whatever, it's football, right? Of course, and then you get on Facebook, and it's like, let's go Army, like just to talk <laughs> shit to my Marine buddies because, right, they are Department of the Navy, right. the men's department, but department nonetheless, right? And there's the running joke. We got the same, like, seven jokes we keep telling them. Right. But whatever. But then you get, like, the, the, the standard classic veteran, and I love them, but it's like, <laughs> right, you see this too, whatever civilians get behind this, and it's like Army-Navy game where everybody on the field is willing to die for their teammates and, and the opposing team and everybody else in the stadium and it's like right it's like borderline cringeworthy mm-hmm. but but then you're also like you also get like a, a full half chub you're like hell yeah fuck yeah we are like look <laughs> at us look how awesome we are yeah we're willing to die regardless of the government regardless of the war regardless of the mission and the purpose we're willing to die be- because of our pride that's what it comes down to right mm-hmm. we're proud of being in the military and it's like, fuck, what a wasted life that would have been if I would have died in Iraq because of an IED, right? And, and look at all the wasted lives that we had because these are all young men and women that had so much potential to give the world. Now it's like, well, shit, I didn't die. You know, I, I think I put up a post years ago on Memorial Day. And it was like, live a life worth their sacrifice yeah. because they signed the check that we at one point said we were willing to sign, but I'm not going to say didn't have the balls to do it or do, no, it just, that's, that wasn't, wasn't our destiny. Yeah. And now that we're home, right. Go back to welcome home. Now that we're home, what are we going to do about it? Cause I, I do have friends um, f- on Facebook and in real life that uh, are gold star widows and oh, fuck. What does it say about me being a veteran that still hangs out with the reserves on the weekends and, and is living the life I want to live? And it's like, it's just, you know, it's one inch here, one inch there, one second here, one second there is the difference between yeah. being welcome home and being being put in the ground. Yeah. That's, and, and sometimes, you know, it's it's a choice. Um, I, I can remember my, my last deployment, my last mission, um, there was a there was an Afghan that I'm I'm pretty sure would have killed us if no one had watched him and I I recognized him immediately as as a potential threat 
And if I had been, you know, five or six years before that, when I wasn't as confident as I was, I was an E6. Uh, mm -hmm. This was 2019. I was an E6 at the time. Still am an E6, but um, I was remarkably confident in both my, you know, my leadership abilities, my marksmanship abilities, my, ab my abilities to end life. Um, mm -hmm. And I put myself right in front of him for 45 minutes watching every movement and telling everybody around me, like, hey, I got this, but I need help, right? I need I need people left and right flanking this guy, just keep an eye on him. Um, and whenever I turn around, I need somebody else to cover him. And, it, you know, if I hadn't made that choice, if I had just kind of like played it off as, you know, I may have done five, six years ago or 10 years ago when I was, I was a recruit and I just didn't understand what was going on. Um, that simple choice could have gotten multiple people killed because this guy was clearly a, a threat throughout the mission. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the only reason he didn't do what I think he was thinking about doing was because I literally put myself in front of him and told him like, Hey man, whatever you, <laughs> I literally said this to him. I don't know if he spoke English or not, but I'm like, Whatever you're thinking about doing, it's probably not a good idea, right? I said that straight to his face, and I just watched him, and and he yeah. was just remarkably uncomfortable from that point on. And I was like, I'm not here to make him comfortable, and I'm there's a chance that I might have to kill this guy. Mm -hmm. um, but like veterans who've been overseas, those they, like there's simple choices like that that we don't really respect until we look back on them. Like I, in that moment, yeah. I didn't really understand what I had done. You know, I, I had gotten back from the mission and I started talking to like my, my fellow, my fellow E6 in my squad. Um, cause we had, we had an E7 for a squad leader and two E6s for team leaders. I was talking to him. Um, and I was like, we were just kind of debriefing and talking about this. And he was like, man, you, you made the right decision. Like you put yourself right there. And I was like, mm -hmm. I, I just didn't even, it was just so natural for me at that point, because that, that was our last mission. We'd run 90, 99 missions at that point. Um, but like, it's only afterwards in the aftermath that you realize that guy could have killed me. Like I may have killed him, but he probably could have killed me. And you don't really recognize as a veteran sometimes those simple decisions that you make can stop life from being taken, or it can be the reason that life is taken, mm -hmm. but it can save lives, right? Like, uh, I mean, Chris Kyle's a great example of this, you know, like how many times did he make a simple decision uh, to, to end a life that how many Marines or, or army members uh, in Fallujah and Ramadi were saved because he ended a life, you know, and yep. what we don't really talk about when we talk about identity is the necessity to make those decisions and how, how hard it is to live with them. Right. We we've been told, don't ask someone if they've, if they've killed somebody. Right. And I'm not going to say I disagree with that, but at the same time, that's that's abandoning the one thing that allows people to open themselves up and express themselves. Right. If I, I I'm not I'm not saying walk around and ask every veteran if they've killed somebody, but they have to talk about it at some point because that's a decision that is remarkably hard to live with, whether you've chosen to actually do it or you chose not to do it. Um, and well, well well, I'll interject here that the, the reason behind the question can't be self-serving. Correct. I know when I got back, I got back from Iraq in 2007 and I was, I was extremely uncomfortable going anywhere in uniform. Even to this day, I don't like, I don't even like going to the goddamn gas station in uniform. Yeah. I, I just did grocery shopping, anything. I don't, I just, I don't, I don't particularly enjoy it, but I remember my dad, I, it, it irritated the shit out of me. You know, I got home in May and it's like that summer I was figuring out my shit and but everywhere i went it was like my dad was like this is my son he just got back from iraq and again this is when the war was still looked favorably favorably upon you know it was 15 years ago yeah and it's like people just were like oh thank you for your service like how hot was it over there it was like yeah it was fucking hot like did you kill anybody i'm like it was hot like my answer to everything was really hot over there well no like 
Did you guys get blown up? Yeah, yeah, it was hot over there. It's like 120 degrees every day. Oh, yeah, you see some dead bodies. I'm like, man, you have no idea how hot it was. Let me tell you, when it's hot, it's hot. 115 degrees, right? Like, I was so irritated because it was like these guys that just wanted to hear a fucking war story. And it's like, yeah. I didn't pull the trigger. I drove a goddamn truck for a year. Yeah. Right? Like, hell, hell, our, 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 our saying in Motor Trans is death before dismount. Whether that, whether I love that or not, right? I joked about that last week with uh, yep. Danny. Maybe he'll give me a vet TV show, Death Before Dismount, right? <laughs> the life of an 88 Mike. But it's like, no, man, I I just I hauled fuel. I honestly, I just, I don't want to say I just, but I hauled fuel. That was my job. My job was to, to run a fuel truck. And if you if you studied or just watched like 10 minutes of any footage of the war in, in Ukraine right now, well, hell, them fuel haulers are pretty damn important, right? <laughs> pretty big God targets. God bless the fuel hauler, right? Pretty, we're, pretty big we're, and explosive we're targets. We're big <laughs> explosive targets, and guess what? You know where that tank goes without fuel? Fucking nowhere. You're welcome, <laughs> right? What, 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 we even talk about, like, teeth to tail. Um, there's this guy I watch on, on, on YouTube quite a bit. Of course, I can't think of his name now. I'm going to have to look him up to give him a shout-out. We should have him on the podcast. Write that down on our notes. Of course, i got to give you his name. <laughs> but anyways, he talks about uh, Ryan. Uh, what's his name? I, I literally was watching videos of his before I came up here. Hold on. I'm going to see if I can. You're... No, that wasn't it. There it is. Uh, Ryan Macbeth. There you go. Uh, anyways, guy has t- he's an IT guy, Ryan Macbeth. We should have him on the podcast. Anyways, he talks about tooth to tail. Basically, how long is it from your infantrymen to the end of your supply chain? And like, it's like a three and a half. And, and also, how big is that, right? It's like, what is it, like four troops for every one infantryman? That's what it takes to support, mm-hmm. right? And of course, they're like, again, they're a bunch of pogues, right? Yeah. People other than grunts for all you <laughs> non pogue knowing individuals. And even like, um, whatever, vet TV, like they ta- constantly talk. If you watch a grunt's life, yep. they talk about constantly talk about pogues. And it's like, yep. I'm a pogue, right? And that's fine, whatever, right? But I also know you need your fuel. And again, that's like the natural camaraderie we have. Yep. Um, but yeah, when I, when I came home, going back to what you were saying before I got on a tangent, which for the record, anyone listening to this podcast, <laughs> tangents will happen. And it was Patriot Nathan Hale. Nathan Hale. I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Nathan Hale. I think I said Thomas Paine. Wasn't even close. Right era, wrong guy. Right era, Anyhow, yeah. Right era. Nathan Hale. We have Nathan Hale High School here in uh, West Dallas. West Dallas, Wisconsin. There you go. So there's your history and geography lesson all rolled into one. Anyways, going back to it about um, killing, right? It, it if you ask the question because you want to get your rocks off and be like, "Fuck yeah!" Like you took care of it, right? And then your civilians referred to uh, the indigenous people of Iraq and Afghanistan in a derogatory fashion. We'll just say that because I don't, we don't need to go down that road because we want to be uh, inclusive of, of all people, right? There's no reason to name call here, but whatever people will. Um, but it's like, you kill one. It's like, well, they're asking that question because they want to get their rocks off. Yeah. Not because they want to understand yeah. the situation you went through. And, and to, to that end, we touched on it earlier, and I, I want to make sure I put this out early and often throughout this podcast. I hate the notion of thank you for your service. I hate it. It's uncomfortable. And this is why. Here, here's why words matter, why language is important. At the at, at transactionally, right? When we're having a conversation, it's somewhat transactional, right? You say things, I say things, you say things, I say things, we have a closing, we go about our business, right? But in order to transcend this transactional conversation, we have to open up the conversation. When you say thank you for your service, that's the end of a conversation. Think about it when you go to a a restaurant, right? They say thank you, and then they kind of stop filling your coffee, right? Go to the front and pay. That's it. Thank you is the end of a conversation, but when you think about it, when you walk into the restaurant, what do they say? Welcome. And that's the whole purpose behind welcome home. I, I learned this from a Vietnam vet who wasn't welcomed home, that welcome home were the two words they yearned for. And and for me, even though there was, you know, guys in Harleys waiting for me and, and, a, and a huge formation and, and people that were excited to, you know, give me the attaboy, good job, troop, good job, soldier, right? They didn't say welcome home, and I didn't feel like I was at home. Those yeah. first 18 months I was home, I just got myself busy. I hate the word busy, but I got myself busy. Yeah. I was busy drinking. I was busy chasing women. I was busy 
um, you know, getting getting a house and building a life, right? Distracting and then yourself. All this, I was dist- oh, was so distracted. Yeah. And then as soon as I wasn't busy, I got bit. You know, I I got busy drinking some more, right? Mm-hmm. But it's like I can only drink so much throughout the day, and then all of a sudden I had to deal with being home, right? So I got home in May of seventeen. By J- January of nineteen, I was a fucking mess. Mm-hmm. I was lost. I remember I spent January, February, March, maybe even going into April. Those three or four months, every day, I was calling people I knew from previous deployments or up at Fort McCoy or my career counselor wanting to go back to Iraq because that made sense to me. Yeah. I'm like, well, I knew my job, right? Like, I, I, Iraq is simple. Don't die. Don't get anybody else killed. Complete the mission, right? We, we talk about our warrior ethos, right? Always place the mission first. I'll never accept defeat. I'll never quit. I'll never leave a fallen comrade. Well, shit. That's pretty simple. I can do those four things every day, right? And I even noticed it, right? I, I, I worked through it eventually through counseling and um, not drinking and getting a job and, and being productive, not busy, but being productive and starting to build the life that I want. And then I remember I got back from Gitmo, and Gitmo was a shit deployment. I, I, I did not have a good deployment in Gitmo. Uh, I almost got kicked out of the army when I was in Gitmo. Uh, I, I got kicked out of my platoon. I eventually got kicked out of my company. It takes. I, I got a rehabilitative transfer to an active duty company. It's a story for another day or hell today. I don't give a shit. But um, it's a good teaser. We call it a teaser in radio. <laughs> um, but what happened was when I got back from Gitmo, when I started going through the divorce, and I moved into this house that wasn't a home. It was a, a house my parents were flipping. And I moved in. There was days I sat there and I said to myself, I wish I was back in Gitmo. Because no matter how shitty it was, I understood it. It made sense. It wasn't until I, I recall this, the first weekend that my daughter um, came home to my then house. I, I had a house in Jackson. It was a house, right? And she came home and she went to her bedroom for the first time. I can remember like it was yesterday. I was like, okay, I'm home. We're home. We have a home. And it was, it was just her and I against the world at that point. But I was home and had not been my for my daughter, right? She gave me purpose. I, I, I talk about this in my TEDx, right? Uh, transforming your pain into passion to define your purpose. I I went from walking, walking the tears, interacting with detainees and soldiers all day, right, to, to coming home, not having a significant other, not having a career and being a father to this 18 month old that absolutely adored me. And, it, and it, she, she grounded me, right? I, I mean, as much as I've taught my daughter, she's taught me more. Yeah. And because I felt at home with her, I didn't have that understanding. And, and for years, my schedule with my daughter before she went to school was four days on, 10 days off. So I picked her up every other Thursday and I had her till Sunday afternoon. I would fucking kill myself those 10 days I didn't have her so that I could spend as much time with her those four days, right? It was like almost like a drill weekend. It was like this, that constant drug I was chasing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd count down the days. It was like, oh, three more days till Penny gets here. Hell to this, to this, um, to this day on my calendar, it says Penny time. It's like, now I have her about once a month for a week, give or take, depending on her school schedule. It's like, my life used to revolve around that, and that was my only purpose. Now she's my number one priority, no doubt about it. Being a father is the greatest title I've ever I've ever had. But it's like it's not it, it, it's not my only purpose because it's taken these years to feel yeah. at home and feel like this is where I'm supposed to be, yeah. and this is where I'm accepted, and this is where I'm loved, and all the things that Maslow talks about. I think it's it's remarkably valuable, especially in in my work. I'm a for those that don't know, I'm a mental health coach. That I don't just work with veterans; I work with all sorts of different people. Um, it's incredibly valuable to have someone that you look to that that you say, "I want to work for the, for you. I want to get better for you." But mm. that person cannot be the person you lean on for the rest of your life. Yep. Right. Like it has to be. Some something that inspires you has to be someone that inspires you, but it, mm-hmm. you cannot lean on them, right? Like in in my work, um, one of the first boundaries I set is with me. It's it's I'm 
I'm here to be a, a consistent support structure, but I cannot be a constant support structure. Mm. I cannot be here for you all the time. I have a whole life behind me, right? Like behind this screen is a family. Uh, below this screen, what you can't see is I just had ACL reconstruction and it is brutal, right? I had COVID mm. after that ACL reconstruction. Mm. So I've like, I had all of this stuff going on. And I, 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 I before that surgery, I had to say to myself, what, what am I going to want to be able to do? And I, I said, I'm not taking on new clients during this time, right? Mm -hmm. With, with having these health issues and also being daycare for my daughter, I'm, I'm not in a place where I can take on more people right now. I can only mm -hmm. take on the people that I have. Um, and even that I'm going to have to limit to a specific time frame. Um, and so I expose that to people as the first boundary I set. It's like, I can mm -hmm. be here for you but I can only be here for you when I'm able to be here for you. And everything after that, I have to set the boundary that helps you understand that I'm going to be consistent, but I cannot be constant because the constant per person that you need to be support for you is you. And that's yeah, you. the, that's the first thing that we're going to practice is I'm going to dismantle and disarm all of the problems that you have within your perspective that say, I can't love myself. I can't appreciate myself. And this is, this is a huge thing that I think veterans need to really work on because we get so inundated with this team mentality and giving and sacrificing and delivering results and, and purpose and all that, that we actually forget to identify ourselves. And we talked about this with Danny last week. Yeah. We forget to identify ourselves as us, as individuals, as Dylan is Dylan. Right. It's yep. not Dylan is veteran, right? It's Dylan is Dylan. Right. Mm -hmm. And my veteran status has informed who I am, but is not everything about who I am. Right. Yep. And even the things, even the trauma that I've been through is not everything about me. It's everything culminates to who I am and learning how to accept and understand and approach the weaknesses and accept the strengths and value the the person that I am, despite all of the issues that I have, is a remarkably undervalued and underpracticed skill, especially in the veteran community. And I think we, we need to get better, I think, especially those of us who are still in, at practicing leadership that recognizes the individual while also yeah. maintaining part of the team and, and learning well, well, how to set boundaries within the organization. Well, what you talk about is lead with empathy. Yeah and be empathetic to yourself first. Right. right. It's that, you know, I think about that, that old men, you know, veteran montage. I don't know if it came from a war movie or what, it sounds like a war movie, right? Like you go to war, not because of what you hate, what's in front of you, but because you love what's behind you. Right. right? And going back to that sacrifice and that selfless service, it's like in the military, we are so instilled that you individually don't matter. It's who you are on the team for God and country and, and the U S army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, Navy, Space Force, whatever it is, right? Yeah. But, 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 but you know, hell, you watch Full Metal Jacket, it's like you are scum, yeah. right? You, <laughs> like, you don't matter. Like, you will die for your country, you, right? You are all equally uh, worthless. <laughs> you are all equally worthless, right? I can't believe, I didn't know they stack shit that high, right? Arlie, Ar Ar Ernie, like, also, if you watch any of, uh, if you watch any documentary about him in particular in that movie, I mean, he was a drill sergeant who applied for that job yeah. and just executed at an extremely high level. Yeah. And uh, he improvised. They said most they could, they could make it. Yeah. They, they could. They, you cried. It, it was all improvised. There was no improvision because it was lines that he used when he was a <laughs> Marine Corps drill instructor during Vietnam. And uh, they even said with him, like, they could have just had one movie of him walking around. And if you watch. I've watched a few of the scenes like in depth, like you can see, like you got to give credit both ways. Not only is Arlie Arnie like phenomenal acting, look at the guys that are standing there, not reacting yeah. or responding. Right. Obviously I think there's like a little bit of real fear in there. <laughs> oh, that's correct. There was like fear, but it's like the Stockholm syndrome. It's like when you show up to work every day and, and you know, I mean, half, full metal jacket is two movies that happens to have the same characters, right? It's like two 60-minute movies, essentially, right? Yeah. But it's like, whatever, right? It's a phenomenal movie. 
um, for what it is, right? It's a movie. Yep. But, but it's like when he comes there and he's screaming at you, like, God, that had, that had to toughen those guys up as, 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 as individual people and as actors, Right, like just getting howard at and just the precision, the accuracy of insults. There, maybe that's what it is—the yeah. accuracy of insults. Um, one thing you said, I wrote this down. And you said it. Th- you said it twice now, but I'm going to say it thrice, right? Because three times, and that's how we remember shit. Constant. I'm sorry. Con- is that I fucked it up. Consistent, <laughs> not constant. Yep. You know, I, I, um, I'm, I'm writing this book. I mean, you're shamelessly plugging your business. I'll shamelessly plug mine, right, as we do, because it's, it's whatever it's part of what we are. But I, but I I, uh, I spoke with a psychologist the other day. We were talking about words and needs and wants and desires and uh, likes and all this stuff. But th- this is what he said, and I, I loved it. He said, there's only three have-tos in this world, right? You have to be born, you have to die, and you have to live. Everything else is a choice. Mm-hmm. And I think about that when you talk about consistent, not constant. It's like, hey, I, I'm going to be there for you. Yes, I will be there for you. But I'll be there for you from this time to this time. Yep. Right? And, and and also, and now you set clear boundaries, which gives people, but it also settles people to a certain, it gives them at ease. Like, okay, I know I can call them. I had a coach about a year ago, Chris Kalinda from the Strategic Leadership Academy. And it was, it was not inexpensive for the amount of money I spent working with him. And I was like, can I just call you constantly? Because at this price, I feel like I need to be able to have you on speed dial. He goes, you can call me whenever you want, and I'll get back to you when I'm available. And I'm like, okay, bet, mm-hmm. right? And the first week, I called him three or four times. And the second week, I called him once. And by the third week of a thing, I was with him for nine weeks or 12, 12 weeks, 12-week 12 program, I didn't call him once. And maybe I talked to him once a month that, out, that after. Because knowing, and he's, he's a high-speed, Colonel Army, fucking hot shit guy. Good, He, he wrote a book. Does a lot of philanthropic stuff, but um, we'll have him on the podcast here in due time. But with him, it's like knowing that he was available was what I needed, mm-hmm. right? Because there's the flip side, right? One person can say, "Well, shit, I'm paying you to be my counselor. You should always be there." But it's like, That's but no, not I, what you're I, for. I've had no, and yeah. even my, I have a counselor at the VA. I see her, her name is Jody. I saw her this morning. Every other Monday, 11 a.m., I'm there, and there's been times where I was struggling on a Thursday or a Friday, and I told myself, you know what, hold on. I don't have or have to, right, I don't have to, right, going back to that have to. I will choose to parlay this until Monday. Yeah. I'm going to work this out on Monday. I got my counselor. I know she's there. And that's the thing with veterans. It's like, especially in the military, there's always something to look forward to. It's like, you, you know, you get the basic training, and you count down, you know, for me, 63 days. Like, you know you're going to graduate in 63 days. And then you get to AIT, and it's six weeks, so you count down 42 days. And then, hell, you get to Iraq, and you're like, this is the day that my 18-month orders are up. Right. And then even now, hell, I talked about it. I got, right, we're recording this episode. In, <laughs> right, shoot, we're, we're, we are recording this episode in December of 2022. My, my contract is up in, or not my contract, I hit my 20 years in April of 2024. Like, mm-hmm. Don't, don't think I don't know that. I've known that in my entire <laughs> life, right? And, and when I was at that 15-year mark and I had the opportunity to sign an indefinite contract in my head, it's like a five-year obligation, and, you know, I'm on my own time. I'm, I'm a quasi-free agent after that, right? I can choose to continue or I can choose to DD-214 and chill. Yep. When we come back home and we don't have these defined moments, these defined points, these these milestones in the road, hell, we didn't even know what direction we're facing. That's tough. Yeah. You know, we come back, uh, we come back and people look at us and they're like, oh, you look squared away. You're, you know, how you come off deployment. It's like, you look great. Probably some of the best shape. Yeah. You, you, you got a nice tan because you've just been, you yeah. know, outside for a couple of years, right? You got a nice tan. <laughs> you're in great shape. You're focused. Yeah. You got your whole life in front of you and you are lost. Yeah. And now your family and your friends and your employers are like, well, shit, you've been gone. They've been living their life the normal way, but it's like you've been fucking gone and you're a mess and you don't even know you're a mess because your emotions are heightened. And then yeah. that that transition itself is in many ways, I think it is a form of trauma. 100% because, trauma. Because, you know, what, what trauma really is is an overwhelm of the 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 nervous system, right? And so when you when you go from a place where – you know, like, and we can relatively define it. Like I was in Afghanistan, you were in Iraq, similar. Um, 
you have purpose, you have value, you have a schedule, you have a routine, you have also, I didn't necessarily have a routine consistently. Um, but you had a job, you had, you knew what you had to do and you had support, constant support nearly, um, mm -hmm. if not yep. consistent, um, you had people you could go to. And then all of a sudden, right. You, you had three square meals a day. You yep. knew where they were coming from. You didn't have to buy anything, right? You didn't have to go out and purchase anything, right? The, 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 the lack of decision-making you right. have in the military is, is amazing. It's, it's, it's so, so yeah. some people are like, oh, I, 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 I hate not having, you, you, you have no idea how freeing it is yeah. when you have no choices. It's like, the you have U money, but you A, can't access it, and B, you got nothing to spend it on. The, that is freeing. The U.S. military is the force that it is because of its logistical ability to take decisions away from soldiers. It's, it's that and easy. Also, <laughs> also, let's not forget, dude, uh, the decisions we make aren't always good. Right. Right? Yeah. Like, in, <laughs> right? Like, there's a reason why you leave every military installation, and there are three guarantees that you're going to find. Right, one is a shitload of new car dealerships, strip clubs, and pawn shops. <laughs> yeah. In addition to bars and restaurants, right? Yeah. The standard, the wall. Like we always talk about Wally World. When you get off of Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, you can go to Wally World, right? I didn't know what Wally World was, and like Wally World, I thought it was this magical place. So you can go to Walmart <laughs> yeah. and, and buy food that isn't terrible and socks that fit, yep. right? Like that's the right. But but it's like when you limit someone's ability to make decisions. It's like limiting their immune system. Yep. It's like all of a sudden now you give them full yep. decision making ability. Yeah, poor choices are going to be made. Yeah, and and uh, uneducated, ignorant, and oftentimes impetuous decisions are, are made. Oh, correct. And, and 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 you're making up for lost time. Hell, that's one of the things we say in the military all the time. Oh, I got to make up for lost time. Yeah. Well, well, it's also not all at once. <laughs> relationships as well is mm. is that you want to make up for lost time, but. That's not how relationships work. That's how that's not how life works. Right. Time, time is gone. Time yep. is a finite resource. Yep. There's no such thing as making up. Well, I see this in business, right? Or hell, we see that in college. Well, hey, I didn't study for a whole semester. Got to make it up and cram the night. You're not making up shit. <laughs> You're just increasing your effort. Yeah. And 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 and, and, and your plan is that it's going to make up for your. You didn't put the time in, right? Uh, uh, resources, right? Resources. It's it's. Time, effort, and money. That's that's basically the resources you have in this world. Yep. And, and 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 yeah, when you give your time, when you sacrifice your time to the US Army, what you're doing is that is the less time that you are spending on you, yep. with your family, with your friends. Right? If if I'm gonna live to be whatever, eighty years old, right, I'll make it even simpler, Hillbilly Math. If I live to a hundred, right, I'm I'm getting there because I put out to the world, now I'm gonna live to right three percent of my life was given freely to the army yep. right well now i got 97 percent to work with yep. versus oh shit i gotta make up time i gotta make up for time i gotta to your point accelerate relationships by doing all this extra shit and it's it is absolutely unsustainable right and it causes many problems you know and, and when we talk about like trying to speed up time or, or make up time in relationships it's often uh um, oftentimes what I've seen is the, the inability to communicate issues within relationships. Mm. And this is, this kind of goes beyond yeah. just military, but, um, definitely what I see is, you know, military service members have such a, such a, they, they're so good at turning on and off the switch sometimes that they, they have the ability mm. to turn off the switch of what it's like to be there. And then when they step into a relationship with someone that wants to understand, they don't have the words to explain it and express it and help them understand it. Um, and on the contrary, right? Oftentimes the people in those relationships don't know how to approach the conversation because there's just so much taboos of like, what is it like over there? Well, I don't want to talk about it. Right. And so there's, there's no real conversations happening. Um, there's also, you know, service members can be hyper aggressive, right. And, and so you have this, this hyper aggressive, hyper masculine, sometimes like this, this necessity to be that, 
uh, representation or that identity that you've been in the military. And that doesn't function in, in a relationship, hmm. you know, and, and like we've, we've all seen it. We've uh, all been there. Yeah, I know. You know? No, it's funny. I mean, I, 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 I was, so I was in Iraq in seven. I started working for waste management in 11, 12, 13, maybe. When did I work for waste? 12? Yeah, 12. I started working for waste management in 12, 2012. Uh, I worked there 12, 13, 14. And, uh, you know, so I'm five years removed from Iraq, but it was my first, like, office, like, non-masculine job. Yep. Let's put it that way, right? Because I went from Iraq to uh, being a tour manager of a band to being a remodeler to a construction company where, like, two-thirds of the guys were, were, were vets, right? Yeah. So it's, like, pure masculine, right? Yeah. Like when people are like, you, oh, you yell because you're in the military. No, no, I yell because my father grew up on a farm and I grew up working construction and that's what I fucking know, right? The military just exemplified that, like, this is what it means to be a fucking man. Anyways, I worked at Waste Management and I was known as and Andy the Hammer Wines, <laughs> right? And my moniker was the angry emailer because I'm like, hey, clear and concise communication. I think I talked about this last episode. Yeah. Bottom line Bottom up line front, front, right? Yep. <laughs> Bottom line up front, you done fucked up, Right? So to your point, it's like that works really well in the military, yep. right? You gotta, right? A, 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 you're calling up a nine line, right? Uh, you you, you got to get that information out, yep. right? You have so report, uh, medevac, right? Let's let's go. Hey, you got you got you know you take issue with somebody? Hell, this is shit that happens organically. Talk to anybody that's been to basic training. They don't teach you what happens. In, like there's no there's no class on barracks etiquette. No. And yet, everybody's story, every, almost every veteran, everyone that's lived in a barracks in basic training, regardless of fucking branch of service, it, it kind of sorts itself out, right? People kind of sort themselves by by race, religion, creed, color, right? Uh, and, and, rank and, first. Right. Well, right. No, I'm saying like basic, where no one knows shit about nothing. Oh, there is yeah. no rank. But you're correct. But right. So we, we make up our own, right? Yep. Race, religion, creed, whatever. You kind of partner. And then eventually there's a clash. Yep. Between two different schools of thought, I remember um, Private Green. I can't remember what was his last name. I started with a C. Anyways, um, big black guy from Southern Mississippi, and I'm white guy from you know. And he had, he had me by fifty pounds, right? We we could say eye to eye, but he had me all day. And I can't remember what it was. He said something. I called him ignorant. Um, I punched first, but he punched last. One of those, right? I uh, I had no problem standing up to him. But I didn't finish on top of that fight. <laughs> but, but and, and you know what I mean? And people took sides. And I can't remember. It was fucking over guard duty. Or it, was some, it doesn't even matter, right? It, it's so insignificant. But it's like at the end of basic, you know, and, and he was in first platoon. I was in second platoon. But we had a, a, a co-op bay, whatever. Like we had everything not lined up. And it's like at the end of basic, we ended up going AIT together. And he was my fucking boy. It's like. You know, like you don't, you, no one has to teach you to throw down and you don't fucking back down from a fight. And it's like, that served me quite well in basic, right? It's kind of like the, you're going to prison, you get in a fight with the biggest guy. Right? I didn't seek this guy out, but he kind of ran his mouth and got away with it. And I wasn't fucking having it. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell you, I could have been 100% wrong or 100% right on why we fought, but I knew I was 100% right standing up for myself and having that, whatever, that masculine energy. And now you bring that shit in the civilian world and it turns out people don't like that. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't serve you well. That's because in the civilian world, it's a negotiation. It's not war. Yeah. Right. And so yeah, like, I hate negotiation. Like that's the, that's the thing is like when, when you're in war, you can, you can get away with that, that, that hyper aggressive focused, you know, energy that, that not, not even get away with it. It, it, it you, it's you strive. It's purposeful. It's very purposeful because right. the, the, the inverse of that would, you would be dead. Yeah. If you're super agreeable and hell, look at that situation you talked about with that individual in Afghanistan. Yeah. Had you been super agreeable or laissez faire or lackadaisical, yeah. you, right? You, you might not be here today. Right. Yeah. And, and and when we're used to a, a, a certain state of being, being highly successful, like you said, you, you can turn it off consciously, but that subconscious yeah. is a mother. That, the, that boils up, and, right? Fight, fight, or fight. L l let's fucking go. My my two favorite books uh, are When the Body Says No and When the Body Keeps the Score, or body, The Body mm. Keeps the Score, right? And both of those titles, like, exemplify something that I think is, is relatively 
misunderstood in the military, right? Like, and in, in we're, we're hitting on it right now. The body does not have the ability to hide emotions and expression, right? Like mm. you may think you're acting, right? You may think you're hiding suicidal thoughts. You may think you're hiding your anger or your fear or whatever, but your body is representing it in a way. And the, t for the people who are intuitive and observant, we can see it, right? And I've, I've really kind of pushed myself to understand this having, having for me, my, my initial trauma was losing my father to, to suicide at six years old. So this is what I've studied my whole life, right? That's the, the inspiration behind me being who I am. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've really learned to watch people and understand people. You can't hide it. Right. And, and to, yeah. to understand more like the aggressiveness and the anger and the fear and the hatred that can come and the resentment that can come as being a, a service member and a veteran, that stuff you also can't hide. And it shows itself in interactions. It shows itself in relationships. And the longer those relationships last, the more it shows because the more comfortable you get. And so if there, yeah. if there's a recommendation I would have for service members, and veterans it's find someone that you can openly have the hardest conversations you can have bottom line up front right like that's what people like myself are for right because you can it's not a negotiation with me it's i want you to express what you need to express and then we're going to dismantle it right and then then i'm going to ask you in in terms that you can kind of dismantle it yourself and understand and kind of break it down to look at it from an objective point of view and look at it from a way that you understand because I have the experience to see that. Right. But that's what, you know, these, these ideas of don't be that guy that goes out and talks to someone is, is remarkably, um, it's damning for, for veterans, right? Because you need someone that can objectively help you see the the failures in your own negotiation styles. And you, you need that, right? Every, every yeah. person needs it, but mm -hmm. veterans especially need to be able to dismantle their own thoughts and say, wow, maybe I am being an asshole here, or maybe I could have handled this in a way that would have come across as being empathetic and respectful and valuing this other person rather than being so bluntly honest that it harms this person or, uh, you know, objectifies or whatever, you know, other not so healthy term that, that comes within relationships that end. So, so a couple of things I wrote down here as you're talking. So for, for one of the things to get our, our, our listeners up to speed, like you're, you're the more clinical, uh, strategic, soft-spoken guy right on to say you're soft-spoken compared to me it already comes out and i'm all about words fucking matter mm -hmm. and 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 so i wrote down a couple of things that you said because there's some things that we whatever we object i'm gonna i'm gonna also challenge you on a couple of the words you use sure. because well words fucking matter um and, and i and i'm more tactical that that's that right so first thing fake the funk right we talk about this that's that's what this is this is imposter syndrome. This is faking the funk syndrome. We know about it. You talk about the longer you get, the closer you get to people, the more it comes out because you can only repress for it so long. Right? We, always, we talk about even in the military, it's like, especially in the reserves, it's like you have the guys that can fake the funk for a weekend, maybe for a two-week annual training, but when you get down, down range, yeah. the, the truth comes out, right? The, 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 you know, the shittiest soldiers in garrison are the best in the field, and sometimes the inverse is true also. Right. So I get those board babies that got a fucking nice uniform but when, when shit hits the fan they, they don't you know their uniform gets dirty and they fucking piss themselves yep. right so so you're right from your you also talked about support right what you don't see so i i use the analogy right your fighting position right can't find out, call a foxhole anymore because it's offensive to foxes um but from your fighting position it's a good fucking joke anyways right like you, you, you use the word help. I hate the words help. So I'm going to continue to challenge you to use the word support. Think about from your fighting position, right? If you are in your own individual fighting position and the trauma you're looking at, the battlefield out there you're, 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 you're dealing with, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta call for support because mm -hmm. this is what's going to happen. There's either someone closer to that target. There's someone next to you that can see it just a hair different, right? 
or they can see it from a 30,000 foot view. The goal here is to find individuals that will support you. And that's what this podcast is all about. It's about providing the support and another perspective. If you think you come back home, I got my shit, I'm good, I'm golden, I'm great. And you're out there faking the funk. You're not, right? Life is going to call you out. And I know that because I've done it, right? And, And whether it comes down to your situation in 2015 with a suicide attempt or me drinking away my fucking problems, people see, you know, we all have this ego that we, you know, people, you think people don't see what we're going through. And it's like, you have fucking no clue, right? You, you survey the 10 closest people to you and they'll, they'll figure it the fuck out. And if you are faking the fun, you are hiding it. Guess what? The person that's going to impact the most is you. That, that's it. The other thing you said that I hate this word, right? Cause it's subjective and you already proved the point with me. So thank you. Hard, hard, hard is hard. Hard is difficult. Hard is this connotation that you can't do it, that it, you know, it is difficult in nature. So I'm going to challenge you, Dylan, and everybody else out there, our listeners. It's not hard. In life, things aren't easy or hard. I, I've removed those words from my vernacular. Catch me if I say them because I need to restate my position. Life is, in fact, simple and complicated. And so you kept using the word dismantle. That's, in, that's important. In order to make life simpler, right, and live a simple, healthy, happy life, we have to dismantle, which is complicated. You are complicated. We are human beings, right, made made up of billions of strands of DNA with individual experiences, 70,000 thoughts a day. We are complicated people. War is complicated. Society is complicated. Relationships are complicated. But to your point, you have to, at some point, you have to. Let's not use the word have to, right? Um, Make the choice to start dismantling what is complicated. Uh, I came back home, and I was so full of rage. I remember being at my mom's house, watching, you know, CNN or Fox News, whatever. It didn't even fucking matter. Whatever was on the TV in the kitchen talking about Iraq and Afghanistan. I was so angry about everything. I'm like, these motherfuckers don't know what they're talking about. And I loved that feeling. I love the feeling of being angry because I felt like that. And now that I was in control, I, I, I like that to this day because it was like, well, shit, at least that's worth fucking fighting for. At least it's worth fucking die, dying for. Hell, I'd go to bars and like even... For years, and even till recently, it's like, if you disrespected me, first thing I want to do is get physically violent, right? Like, it's like, fuck it, at least it's worth it, right? And and now looking back at it, that doesn't serve me very well. And that's not even consistent with who I want to be, but it was so ingrained in me in the military that fight first, figure it out later, right? Shoot twice, aim once. Like, fuck it, let's go. Because, because I was in this, you know, lower brain mindset, all the time because my brain was complicated. You know, call it PTSD, call it PTS, whatever you want. It's a big ball of fuck. Yeah. And then once you start dismantling it by surrounding yourself with people, and, and, and you know you can you can read and watch videos, hell, listen to this podcast, all very good healthy behaviors. But eventually, you got to hear your own words come out. Yeah. And others have to hear that, right? Even if you meditate or diary, all again, all healthy practices. But I'll argue that it's completely different once you put it out to the world. Once you put it out to the world, and it becomes real. You own it. And and to have someone repeat it back to you, in yeah, because because it's all it's all perspective, right? Like I yeah, I think it's you know a majority of the issues that we face is a matter of perspective, and. But that includes, I think, health issues. I think a lot of, you know, when you when you look at a lot of health issues, a lot of health issues that that especially veterans face is stress focused. Right? When you yep. see uh, heart issues and um, other health issues, it's very much instigated by stress and how stress brings those on. Um, if you look at the human body, stress is not a good thing for it. Right? If you want to read oh. something that's beneficial to understand that specifically. Read When the Body Says No by Gabor Mase. Um, the body does not like stress. It does not handle stress well. Um, and so 
when you learn how to approach things, thoughts, ideas, views, uh, from different perspectives, you stop being angry because anger mm -hmm. provides stress. You stop being hateful because hate is stress. You stop being a lot of things and, and making that a part of your identity because that stress is actually, it, it's going to destroy you. It's going to kill you. Right? It's also, for me, it's fucking addicting. Yes. I, I talk about the vices I have, right? I, I like to gamble, but it's not a problem. I quit smoking 13, 14 years ago. I, 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 I have a very healthy relationship with drinking. Women, to a certain extent, are a vice of mine or had, had been in the past. And, and be, um, because at the time, I, I didn't understand or respect healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. right? And all those things in life, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I understand them. I understand how I show up. I love stress. I, yeah. I really do. It gives me purpose. It gives me it, – it, it, it fuels my fire. It, it's, it's quasi chaotic and uncontrollable in, in the fucking – your bud boils and you're like, fuck yeah, let's go. Like I, 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 I love it. And I also feel like it's when my best self shows up. It's like, fuck yeah. Give me chaos. Give me, give me the problems. Nobody else wants to handle or can't or choose whatever, right? Whatever all those fucking words are. It's like fucking stress is addicting, but it's a really good way of getting busy and you're fucking busy when you're stressed. Yeah. doesn't mean you're productive, right? Doesn't mean you're living the life that you want to live. Doesn't mean that you're you're, you're building a future. Yep. I stress is my drive. I, I agree. You know, I even even me like um, this is my third ACL reconstruction. I can tell you the best the best side of me. And I was thinking about this a couple couple weeks ago before my surgery. The best side of me comes out when I'm when I'm hurt, right? When when there's enough stress on on my body that says. Hey Dylan, you've got to earn it now, right? When I you got to put in the work. My perspective shifts to saying, mm -hmm. "Hey, you've got to you've got to work harder," um, and I have something that I can't deny anymore. That's when mm -hmm. you know the best side of me comes out. But I've I've learned, you know, especially throughout the last couple of years, that and this is one of the reasons I actually I actually really enjoy poetry is that that's not necessarily my best self, right? Mm -hmm. That's the self that is. Uh, that is that I've I've built and packaged for my last resort, and though it mm. is good, it is not best, you know. And I think this is the perspective because it's it's un you know, and to use the 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 words that you were using earlier, it's unsustainable, right? Yeah. I can't I can't be the person I am right now in, in recovering um, because. If I were to try to do that for the rest of my life, I, it's brutal, right? Like it's, it, mm -hmm. it would, it would push a lot of people to the side because I'm so focused on this. Um, and so my best self is actually calm. My, my best self is actually peaceful because I have the ability to look at my son without anger, right? Right now, mm. you know, and I, I had me and me and him had a, had a, kind of an issue this past weekend because I got angry and I had to look at him and I had to say, you know, your decision was wrong. You're right. Like we're, we're, you were wrong in this decision, but how I handled it, I need to take accountability for myself because I got angry when I didn't need to, but I have a lot of other things going on that affected me, but that's on me. That's not on you. And mm -hmm. I, I, I had to apologize for that because that's not my best self. My best self isn't yelling at my son or getting angry with him or getting upset with him. My best self is actually having the ability to recognize what he's got going on and what I've got going on and finding a way to make peace with it and create a, a relationship between both of us while also managing what I have going on and figuring that out and walking myself through it. Or, you know, I won't use the word help, finding support for myself. See, I, I, see I'm going to get you to stop using certain words. Well, I, here's, here's what I think <laughs> because help in, in, in some definition is to give assistance or support to. So I don't necessarily agree that it's not a, a useful word because it's the same thing as what you just said, support, right? Support is in the definition, but 
I could see how it's, support it's, it's, is a little bit better. This, 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 is, this is where I see it. You know, when you are stuck in a hole, help is, I'm outside the hole, let me pull you out. Support is, let me get in the hole with you. And that's the nuanceicalness, right? There's certain words I eliminate, like recommend versus suggest. And, then, and, and, and I define them in a way that I understand the difference. And, and so I give you shit, right, using the word help, because there's a negative connotation for like, oh, I don't want to ask for help. Okay, cool. Maybe but we should change people, the connotation. Well, I don't want to change fucking I'm, connotations. I'm I want to work within the parameters of life. I'm a definition like, guy. You're, I think, I, I got you. I think you're a visual right. person because, like, the 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 visual yeah. of that is help is reaching down, support is pushing up, right? right. And so, like, hundred percent. I look at definitions, and so we just look at it from different yep. perspectives. That's correct. But it's the yep. same conceptualization. Correct. We just need to change the connotation. I think. That, that's correct. I, I remember when I went to mass resiliency training. One of, literally, one of the first within the first half hour, maybe hour of that class is asking for help is a sign of strength, not weakness. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Oh fuck, that's heavy, right?" And now I even were, I, I even eliminated the word weakness because I just I, I got rid of it, right? And then with me versus help versus support, it is not so much the definition; it is the 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 idea that there there are two different things and they are different. And and if we're uh, and if we're honest, right? Because people are like, hey, I want you to support my cause. It's almost like you're the victor, right? You're it's it's it, it's victorious language. Support my cause. How I got a sign, right? Support the troops, right? Like that's like, oh, I let's do that, right? Let's we, we're right versus help. It's like get me help for me. It's like help me out of this thing or help me get to this thing. Well, no, no, no support me because I'm already doing it. I'm already committed. Support me because I'm already on the fucking journey. And, and so, I, I, right, whether it's this podcast or just life, I'm not going to die I have a thought. on the, okay, and, and, let me finish my damn story. I'm, finish my story. I'm, I'm not interrupting I, I want to inter interrupt interrupt you because it, oh it, it represents, like, Please. The, before the story. Good story. He, when you say support, it makes sense yeah. when you say, I'm on the journey, I need support. But yeah. what if the way you're using help in terms of definition um what if that person isn't on their way and the reality is that needs someone to reach in and say, Hey, you need the, to the, look the, at there's this somewhere no, that, okay. That's a great, I, I like this. There's somewhere in order to support someone. You have to meet them where they're at, right? Helping them. Hey, I can help you from a distance. Hey, Dylan, I'm over here. Come on. Hey, over here. It's great over here. I'm on the other side of the fence. The grass is green. Let me help you. Come on. Hey, gummy. I'm right here. Right? You're right. They're not on that journey. Support you. Hey, where are you at today? What can I do today to support you with where you're at? That's the other thing. When you're stuck in a hole, when you're stuck, we've all been stuck. When you're stuck, you don't even know where to start. To have someone say, hey, you don't know where you're at, and you don't know where you're going, and I'm going to support you. That's the other thing. I, I just thought about this, right? Help is an action, right? I'm going to help you do this thing, right? And I'm going to support what you're doing. Support is the person. I'm going to support the person. And again, we can get into the nuanceableness of words, and I'm not going to die on this hill, right? There's certain hills I'm going to die on. This isn't one of them. My point is understanding where they're at today is important. Because you have a lot of bleeding heart people, especially in the veteran community. It's like, I'm helping. I want to help. It's like, but you didn't ask the questions. You don't even know what you're supporting. Right? It goes back to the thank you. Thank you for your service. Uh, let me tell you something. You're not helping because you're making me feel awkward. You're making me feel what right? all these things that I don't want to feel by saying thank you for your service. You're not helping the situation. Right? Now, if you support me, here's the thing about support. You got to ask some questions and be vulnerable in order to support. I look at look at this podcast. We're supporting veterans, family members, friends, significant others, whatever. We're supporting them by understanding what they are potentially going through because we've gone through it, and we're not convincing them anything. We're just supporting them by by consulting and giving information that's available. And again, pick two other fucking words if you want to. My 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 point is rewriting the narrative on how do we take care of others, right? Do it with them, not for them. Yep. It's a hand up, not a hand out. 
These nuanceful things really do matter when we think about life and society. And so I'll, I'll argue that point of, of support versus help. Hell, you, a year ago, you supported me, right? It was, we met at a networking event. I'm like, hey, you're a mental health counselor. Like, I want to bring some more awareness to veterans. Will you support me in this cause, this mutual cause? I had a, I had a plan. You know, this plan went from you and I sitting in the other room talking TikTok videos to you and I sitting on the conference room table, right, to, to – um, Marco and Fabio, the guys that were creating that content for us, be like, hey, you know what? What resonates is there's a lot of veterans, especially that E5, E6, O5, O6, right, that are transitioning from veteran or from, you know, soldier, sailor, airman, marine to veteran, the civilian world. And they're watching a lot of your content. They want to understand what is that like? Yep. Hell, I see in the reserves. I have my fellow reservists that are AGRs, Active Guard and Reserve, where they don't understand what it's like to be a reservist because they either it's been years since they've been a reservist or they've been active duty in some capacity since day one, even if they're in the National Guard or the reserve component. They're, they're looking for support from our perspective. Mm -hmm. And now it's turned into this podcast where it's like, hold on, let's let's not be time sensitive. Let's have conversations to support those because we've been on this path. We know what path. They might be on the starting line and we're 10 feet from it. That 10 feet from the starting line is pretty significant mm -hmm. when you're talking about a, 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 a marathon that is life. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, that, that's why I, 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 I will continue to use the word support and also words like complicated versus hard because what, what, what's hard for some isn't hard for others. But complicated is not when, when someone says, hey, that's, that's complicated. Okay. Now you're speaking from a place of vulnerability, and we can you can do something about complicated. We can dismantle it, your word, to make it simple. Okay, well, can we do that? Yes, we can. Okay, well, what do we need to do that? And now we're present-focused, future-minded, whatever, right? We're not living the past, right? PTSD, veteran connotation, talking about the war, it's all past-focused. That's the challenge. It's it, I love talking about the war. I love fucking talking about the good old days and bullshitting with my veteran buddies. It's beautiful and it's comfortable and it's it's fulfilling and you relive these emotions. But like Danny said last week, it is not future focused. Right. It is not a way to build a sustainable, repeatable life. Right. Yeah, I I agree. All right, let's let's put a bow on this. Uh, great episode, great conversation. I, I love the fact that we're doing it. I, I can tell our, our you and our listeners and, and God himself or herself, Alanis Morissette, uh, that Morgan uh, Freeman, Morgan Freeman, <laughs> whoever, um, that this to me, right, th this is part of the support journey, right? You support me, the listeners, and, and it, the, the one person that gets something out of this supports me, right? And just the action of taking this time you know, 60 minutes to 90 minutes a, a week is huge. It is huge for me on my journey. I'd love to hear some of your feedback from today's episode. It's top takeaways. It's a conversation. And, you know, for me, it's this is stuff that I talk about constantly. I, mm -hmm. You know, I, whether it's veteran community or not, I, I'm, I'm always talking about this stuff. And what what I like about this is I'm not always the expert right and so i love having people like danny on i love having conversations with you because you provide a different perspective that initiates different thoughts and mm -hmm. challenges me like you should challenge me people should challenge me that's the that's why i put myself out there i've if if i was if i was a different person you know i i i wouldn't want to talk to anybody because people would challenge my thoughts and be uncomfortable and then i would be embarrassed or i'd be upset or whatever right but the reality is is when you challenge my thoughts i learn something mm -hmm. but that's a perspective and yep. that ability to manage perspective rather than create emotion is is dependent on how you actually look at mm -hmm. expression Right, me expressing expressing what I feel, know, think, do, to you, and you challenging it is not an attack on me. Right now, it might be if it's a different person looking at me differently, and I have to judge that. I have to look at that. But I know it's not from you because we've had experiences together. We've talked a lot. Um, 
And so like this is we're we're conducting what I think is necessary for other people to do. We're creating a space that we can actually have conversation in that is comfortable in some way that's focused on progress, that's focused on support, that's focused on mm -hmm. um, expression and understanding and empathy, where you and I can both be vulnerable with, with different things. I've clearly talked about my, my own suicide, I've talked about my dad's suicide, um, and without a doubt, I'll talk about other things that are vulnerable for me. You as well will uh, undoubtedly throughout this, this, this journey, and that's what's necessary. If you want to come home, right, and not just be welcomed home by someone else, but to come home yourself, I think it's, mm. it's, it's a necessity for you to create what we're creating here. It's find people that can challenge you and respectfully open you up to, mm -hmm. you know, questioning yourself and looking at yourself and challenging yourself, but also looking at you and valuing you as a human being. Like I value Andy. Um, and I know Andy values me. That's why we're here. And those are the relationships that really develop progress and develop you as a human being and teach you how to love yourself and appreciate yourself and craft an identity that's not just veteran focused, but actually focused on you. And I, I think that's what I think we were trying to, to do with this episode. And I think we did it. Yeah, no, I, I really like that. You know, the, the episode started with what does it mean to be a veteran, right? That, that was, that was, that was, the, that was our, our, our challenge today. That was the thesis that, um, you know, on the topics we had to choose from, and that was it. And, and I really love what you just landed, right? The, the veteran experience, we can talk about um, what we went through, what, you know, what I went through, what you went through, what we've seen in working with people. We can talk about trends at the end of the day, the experience that you're going to go through as a veteran, as individual, yeah, very. there, there are, there are certain things, right. The, the five stages of grief, right. That you're going to go through, uh, whether, like you said, this is stress or this is trauma, there are some trends and there's some generalizations that certainly, you know, uh, hundreds of years of psychology can, can back up and prove at the end of the day, you, even if you have all the answers to the test, you, the veteran and the family member, you got to go through it. Yeah. You got to lean into it. You got to feel it. Because we can talk about it, you know, w whether you're, you're, you know, you're watching content like us or you're writing it down in a journal or you're meditating. Eventually, you have to put it out to the world that this is me. Hear me roar. This is our way. Hell, I've, I've been home from um, Iraq 15 and a half years, and this is the first time we're like, you know what, let's just have some conversations where I'm not up on a stage preaching. I'm not telling jokes. I'm, I'm being vulnerable and honest. With those around me, and I challenge fellow veterans to do the same. Find your tribe, um, and, and I'll open it up here. This is this is where we want you. If if you're a veteran that has a story to tell, you want to be part of this journey. You want to um, surround yourself with people that will take the time, but will put in the time, not just take it, but we will, you know, actively s sacrifice our time. Right? Let's use some of the words from the episode. Yeah. Sacrifice our time to make you a priority, mm -hmm. and, and support you. We want to have you on the show. We want to have you because, again, we want to gain as many perspectives as possible. Just like my, my daughter supported me and taught me more than she'll ever know, this is the same truth that comes with the perspectives we want. So if you're a veteran, if you're a spouse of a veteran, you employ veterans and you have questions or you have situations, we want to hear you. This this is an opportunity for us to have civil discourse, if, if so be it. You can be a pissed off veteran, and we'd love to hear from it. Because just like Dylan wants to be challenged, and I like to be challenged, right? We want to be challenged and, and see things from another perspective. At the end of the day, voices will be heard. There's going to be some things that we agree on and disagree on, and that's part of the human experience. So that's my challenge to you. you know, it, it, as of the recording of this episode, we haven't released any content in this vein yet. You know, as as people start listening, reach out to us. Um, you can find us both on LinkedIn, Facebook. Dylan's really big on uh, TikTok and Instagram. Um, well, our, our, our information is readily available. If you find us on LinkedIn, I mean, how my cell phone, my personal cell phone number is listed there. It's not difficult, right? So as you're out there in the world, navigating this world, you're looking for support. You don't even know where your tribe is. Start here. You found us already, which means you're not even at the starting line anymore. You've taken at least one step for continued support on your journey. Reach out to those 
um, that will support you. And, and I can speak from my perspective, and, and Dylan Dale, Dale will share it with this. We're here to support yep. you in all the ways that we can. Um, like you said, it, 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 we will be uh, consistent with with our offerings as far as podcasting and content to, to support you on your journey. But the, the person that has to be constant is you. You have to constantly show up and make the choices that are best for you. Starts with the thoughts. It starts with the words, really, then the thoughts. Thoughts turn into choices and actions. Actions turn into behavior. Behaviors turn into habits and habitually live a good life. If no one said it to you recently, I'll say it to you now. Welcome home.